steely-eyed television network controllers that natural history programs were enjoyed by everybody. And they'd trot along the road sort of pacing the car, you know, yeah. and really oh, looking nice. charming like yeah. sort of clockwork toys. Could we, could we show you how they run? Yes, I'll tell you what, I'll go to the well, other yeah, end. If you could, yeah. yes. If you could sort of field her off that end so she doesn't yes. fall off. It'd be marvellous. Now on your marks, get set, go. I don't go over. Oh, yes, that's very nice. <laughs> Are you going to go back? Come on. Oh. That's wonderful. Go back again. Oh, no. <laughs> you see this extraordinary swift movement. <laughs> Very sweet, isn't it? <laughs> well, Peter was really a pioneer. Charming. He convinced people what conservation meant. You know, in those days, if you, if you used the word conservation or ecology, people looked at you blankly. They didn't know what the hell you were talking about. So Peter made that very real to, 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 to the, the average sort of man in the street, whatever that species is. And also, he was adamant that some species that had got down to a very low level should be kept and bred in captivity for fear that we should lose them forever. Now, this was a, a very new concept. And, of course, a concept that, that uh, a lot of naturalists fought against to begin with because they said, you know, uh, an animal in a cage is anathema. Uh, never will we have an animal in a cage. We'd rather... In fact, I've heard some so-called conservationists say I'd rather an animal species died out in the wild rather than put it in a cage. Well, Peter changed all that, you see. We, of course, being an island, tend to concentrate on island faunas. And one of the island faunas that we've been particularly interested in is Mauritius. And, of course, it was Peter who wrote the original report on what should be protected in Mauritius. Of course, Carl Jones has got a big colony of these in... in uh... Oh, yes, yes. But uh, how many have you bred here, actually? Now we've bred uh, 35. Well, oh, that's pretty good. It's mm. not bad. It's not bad. We sent yeah. some to America to establish them yeah. there. And uh, they're awfully silly birds, aren't they, really? Oh, they're stupid beyond belief. <laughs> and the moment they lay an egg, they kick it out of the nest. Yeah. I mean, they don't deserve yeah. to survive, really. Uh, <laughs> never mind. They're very pretty, aren't they? Aren't they pretty? It's a lovely thing. Peter had become the first star of natural history television. He had married Philippa in Iceland in 1951 after a brief war-torn first marriage, and they travelled the world together. After we'd been doing the look programmes for some time, we had the opportunity of doing some conservation expeditions, going to foreign places and getting involved with scientific work, and somehow this brought us into doing what we called faraway look programmes. One of the places we went to was Australia, and we went to the island south near Flinders Island, where we camped and we ringed Seriopsis geese, or Cape Barren geese, which is an endangered species. And we were filming those as well, of course. We had wonderful opportunities for going to different places to see other projects going on. And one of the places was New Zealand, on an island where there are some of this amazing little lizard, which is called a tuatara, extremely primitive. It has a sort of mystical third eye, which you can just see on the top of its head. It's not really an eye, but it is the remains of what used to be this pineal eye. And they live in holes, which they share with shearwaters, or mutton birds, as the New Zealanders call them. And we were helping the scientists who were working there, seeing whether the birds that they were sharing their holes with were ringed. And the whole thing was absolutely fascinating. Peter's very involved always with any kind of research work that's going on when we visit a place. They ask for Peter's advice on their scientific projects, and we both become involved. I mean, it's interesting, it's exciting, and we enjoy it. Peter has got an enormous skill uh, of bridging the gap between the science and the, the general public. And he does it actually by pretending that he's not a scientist, which of course is rubbish. Uh, I mean, anybody who's seen any of his marvellous diaries, uh, which have been published, thank goodness, or at least parts of them have, about 5%, I should think, uh, see that this is a, uh, uh, an observer of genius who notes animal behavior, who notes difference between species with the accuracy and uh, meticulousness of a great observer and therefore a great scientist. Peter Scott came to my institute in the Wiesen with a great stack of sketchbooks containing fishes. 
And if ever I did something worthwhile in my life, it was pointing out fishes as an object of art to Peter. And in this sketchbooks, there were practically all coral fishes in beautiful portraits. And we could put names to most of these fishes. And having done so, I asked Peter of what book he had taken the systematic order of these fishes. And he said, book? What book? One needs no book. And that made me realize what a really great gestalt perception. He sees a class of animals and needs no book to learn its systematics. He just sees them. He just sees them. He learned to, to dive with, a, with an aqualung and, and then produced, I suppose, the first fish recognition handbook, which based on the, on, the, on the sort of handbooks you have normally for birds. And I think this also opened a completely new uh, view of, of wildlife and, and conservation. In fact, I think he had a, a really tremendous influence on people's thinking about uh, conservation and wildlife. Well, you know, the one place that Peter had never been to in all the world was the Antarctic and he suddenly had this fantastic opportunity to go. And the reason he wouldn't go, of course, was because everyone would think that he was treading in his father's footsteps and he'd get all that sort of publicity. And we talked about it and we said, well, you know, we, here's this opportunity. It would be absolutely ridiculous not to accept. And so he went. Peter may have looked down on his father's footsteps with trepidation, but the BBC saw a golden opportunity and sent Charles Lagos, the faraway look cameraman, to record the moment for posterity. As I walked towards it, I could see tiny crystals floating in the air, which shone like fireflies in the direction of the sun. So here it is, a calculated spot on the snow, an invisible goal almost an abstract objective. So little for a man to pin his ambition to. We had been talking about the, the rigors of the weather and the climate and the cold, and suddenly it did go very quiet. I think it was a very emotional moment for all of us. We, we stood there and, and looked at this white expanse, which had almost nothing above ground at all, except the flag, which was now flying the American flag. Standing at the South Pole, I then imagined, of course, what it must have been like for my father when he got there. Got there, of course, to find that the great explorer, the great Norwegian Amundsen, had got there before him. And knowing that he had 800 miles to walk back pulling the sledge with his four companions. And I just could feel, I could absolutely feel the despondency that he must have felt at that time. He, he wrote in his diary, Great God, this is an awful place. And it must have been just that. Well, when he faced the journey back, he was certainly very disappointed and uh, disappointment is a great handicap to a successful achievement of any objective. But I think that, the, that he would have made, found it easier to make that return journey if he hadn't. But what he described in his diary is without the reward of priority. These tragic questions of what might have been are ones Peter Scott had learned to live with. He was not prepared for the implications of incompetence leveled against his father in a recent book, which was also made into a television serial.
I think people have been given a picture of my father, which I don't personally think is very near the truth. It's very easy to look back on what the attitudes of mind were uh, in his time. And, uh, you know, in 1912, um, people looked at life rather differently from the way they do now. It's very really important to realize how attitudes change and how, in a way, the moralities change too, so that the whole story entirely changes its character. I suppose you could say that the kind of determination that kept Captain Scott going when he went to the South Pole is the kind of thing that has kept Peter going in his conservation efforts. He's driven forward with a determination to see it right through to the end, and he is a great optimist. Peter saw, I think, before almost anybody, uh, in this country at any rate, of the ecological disasters that were going to afflict the world. Uh, he saw them uh, initially in very uh, simple terms that anybody could appreciate. That is to say, he saw that certain species of animals were about to become extinct. Well, one day, Max Nicholson and I said, we've got to start a proper fundraising operation. We must start something called the World Wildlife Fund. And then one of the things we thought we ought to do was to make certain we had some good figures as leaders. And uh, at that time, Prince Bernard was very much involved uh, in conservation, and so was Prince Philip. I visited the Slimbridge, you know, with the Wildfowl Trust in the very early days, and sort of got interested in, in the in the Wildfowl Trust, and, and at that time he was also um, doing a lot of broadcasting and lecturing and uh, fundraising for the Wildfowl Trust, and also doing these natural history programs. And, and I think he also had tremendous enthusiasm and ambitions for the World Wildlife Fund, because he, he did persuade me to become an international trustee or, or member of the international board. And um, the occasions when I did attend, he was always driving and pushing and getting people to get on with it, you know, and do some more and raise some more money and so on. Peter's tireless international chairmanship over the next 20 years and the beguiling panda logo he drew from a friend's sketch helped make the World Wildlife Fund the most powerful conservation lobby on Earth. £40 million has been spent on more than 6,000 projects in over 135 countries. Peter's globetrotting became devoted almost entirely to the politics of conservation, and in 1973, his efforts were rewarded with a knighthood. Now, way back at the beginning of this, um, I did a series, I was invited to do a series of picture cards by uh, the tea people, Brooke Bond, and they were 50 species. These were a cross-section of the most colourful and interesting ones that people would understand. And of course in this book there are some of the ones that I most vividly remember that we actually work to try and save and some of the ones that we have perhaps succeeded in rescuing. Things like the Bermuda petrel and the Galapagos flightless cormorant. Here I come to an old friend, the Nene or Hawaiian goose which we played a part in saving from extinction, and the Laysan teal, which we also breed here in great numbers and which does quite well. Then we come to the California condor, which of course is down to very small numbers. I see that in 1963 there were between 60 and 65 individuals. Uh, now there are only eight left, and it's been agreed that they should be brought into captivity and I hope that everyone will be. It's very important that they should be. Then we come to the cranes, uh, of which there are 18 species, and George Archibald, who set up the Crane Foundation, has done a fantastic job of breeding them in captivity and returning some to the wild. And in particular, he's been dealing with the North American whooping crane and the Asiatic white crane, then we come to the Arabian oryx, 
which was a very successful and exciting endeavor because here was the first example ever of a species which had become extinct in the wild, had been bred up in captivity and had been released again into the wild. And this is the first time that's ever happened. It's a sort of total milestone on captive breeding and therefore a milestone of conservation. And then of course there are things like the orangutan, which the situation is a little bit better for now, and the various lemurs in Madagascar, and those uh, are still greatly endangered. And then it came on to the whales. And so he goes on. Now, in his 77th year, and not as strong as he used to be after a serious illness two years ago, Peter Scott is still at work promoting the cause of nature worldwide, particularly the desperate cause of the whales. The blue humpback fin, say, and sperm whales were hunted one after the other in the Antarctic until the numbers of each species were too low to make whaling worthwhile. There will be a large announcement made by Greenpeace and other organizations in favor of a world park status for the Antarctic. These journeys also give me the opportunity uh, to meet very often the decision makers, the heads of the governments of different countries, and uh, if you, if you don't get to the decision makers, you haven't any chance of getting conservation measures put into force and, and really observed. So this is one of my objectives, a sort of ambassadorial job, if you like, which really helps, I think, to get practical conservation implemented. see, one of the real problems is that as the population increases, so they begin to feel that they need every inch of space just in order to live their lives. Now, how do we get across to them that there must be some areas of uh, natural communities of plants and animals in order to keep the endangered species from becoming extinct? And this is one of the big problems. My own belief is that this should be done because I think that people need, uh, spiritually, they need to have conservation areas. And this is something that uh, is perhaps a part of, or should be certainly, a part of all civilization, and is already becoming a part of civilization. People realize that national parks and nature reserves are an important part of human life. Or put another way, Peter explored his father's legacy and found he had been left the secret of a happy life. He has seen his personal dreams come true and now some of his public ones as well. He has returned to Mauritius to see how the program he wrote so long ago for the world's rarest bird of prey is working out in the hands of Welsh ornithologist Carl Jones. These are two of the young kestrels that we've bred this year. This year has been particularly successful. We've um, we've already reared 14 babies, and, we, and we have uh, two or three eggs l still left to hatch. And this is particularly good when we consider that the the wild population has only reared five youngsters this year. So here we have the world's rarest falcon that only 10 years ago, a bit longer than 10 years ago, was down to just one pair. And of course, it was really amazing. it was decided yeah, then that really. that we should have. Um... Come on, oh dear, that one's oh, a bit yeah. antisocial. <laughs> They'll probably come back out. Anyway, it was decided a number of years ago that one of the most realistic ways of saving this species would be to bring it into captivity. Yes, we had lots of problems, of course, in getting the right breeding stock, but now we seem to be on the right road, and we have 14 adult birds and 14 babies, and out of those. 14 babies, four have been released back to the wild this year. And last year we reared five youngsters. 
So in just two years, we've virtually doubled the whole world population of Mauritius castrols. It's fantastic. It's a really it? tremendous success, isn't it? If we really can keep it going and getting them out into the wild, we should have a bird species saved. I think so, yes. We wander up here. I can, I can actually show you where we're trying. Um, Finally, uh, trying there is the most magic moment of all for this boy they so successfully interested in nature. The chance to release back to the wild a creature he has played a large part in saving from extinction. I've got one of the birds. This is a young male. I put a hood on its head to keep it um, quiet and so that it doesn't peck yeah. us. This one actually looks fine, so I think we can remove the hood and then we can yeah. release it. Okay. So we remove the hood. Yeah. I give that to you. Be careful it doesn't peck you. Watch its feet. There are. Oh. There we go. Fantastic. Well, it's difficult to find words for Peter, but he, he actually told the world at large uh, a truth that all children have always understood, uh, which is that uh, there is an extraordinary fascination about other organisms with which you share life. It, you don't have to tell the kids who come to a place like this in the middle of, of London, surrounded by traffic and industry and so on, they know that a dragonfly is fantastic. They know that the larva of a caddis fly is, is an amazing thing which you can watch it forever. He's the patron saint of world conservation. Sir Peter Scott, who died earlier this week. And that special tribute was a change to our scheduled programmes, Soap and Sledgehammer, which will return to Late Night Late in two weeks' time. Right after the break, our Sunday cinema film, The Trigon Factor. Happy with your wash? Not you again. Yes, I'm 100% happy. It's perfectly clean. Even? Even close-up. Yes, goodbye. Smell it. Smell it? OK, so I can smell something when I iron, but this is Ralph's sweaty work shirt. Actually, it's bacteria. Bacteria? It's the bacteria that causes smells. But I just washed it. At today's low temperatures, some detergents have problems shifting bacteria. So what do you suggest? Aerial automatic. You can prove this, I suppose. Look, Aerial's hygienic cleaning system removes dirt and the lingering bacteria that causes odour, even at today's low temperatures. The smell's gone. Then the bacteria's gone. So you'd say for stubborn stains and lingering odours, nothing outperforms Aerial Automatic. No, I'd say that on tough dirt and smells, nothing beats Aerial. Oh, right. When you turn up at an airport, who knows what you might face? But imagine a service that helped cut through it all. Cut through the crowds, hassles, formalities, so you can check in up to ten minutes before takeoff. Imagine food on every flight. Backup planes. And for frequent business travellers, a card that checks you in and issues your ticket and boarding pass automatically. 
This is British Airways' new Super Shuttle Executive. Clearing your path from A to B. British Airways, the world's favorite airline. The astonishing world of the microscope is revealed on four new stamps from the Royal Mail. A snowflake magnified ten times, a fly's head magnified five times, blood cells magnified 500 times, a microchip magnified 600 times. The stamps are on sale from September the 5th onwards. At main post offices, you can buy them in this presentation pack or as postcards to send or collect. Royal Mail Stamps, beautiful gifts you'll want to keep. If we said we thought Carlsberg could put hairs on your chest, it would be somewhat unbelievable. If we said Carlsberg could make you more attractive to women, it would be claiming slightly too much. If, however, we said we believed Carlsberg was the best lager in the world, it would be true.